Uh, so I'm going to present to you a little bit today about forest management. Uh, my name is Abe Wheeler. I'm a forester. I work on the Roseburg District, the south half of the Roseburg District, which is really a kind of unique place. It's a mosaic of moist and dry forests. Um, so we've been working on this plan for two and a half, two to three years, something like that. Uh, 16, was it, about 1,600 pages and 10 pounds, and there was a lot of, kind of blood, sweat, and tears that are mixed in in the text there. So I'm, I'm really excited to kind of crawl out of the cave and share some of this, this information with you um, because it's been, you know, we've been working on it as a team for a long time, so finally we get to share it. And like the facilitator is saying, is, uh, um, the whole purpose of this meeting is to in, help inform the public so we can get you know, high, really high quality comments as we formulate the proposed RFP, which will be the, you know, essentially the management plan that we're managing it, these lands under. Uh, so, I'm going to go over a brief overview of the alternatives, um, the purpose of needs, need, and then three major things that affect you know, long-term sustained yield to production and forest management. And one is the size of the harvest land base, one is the um, intensity of harvest, and then other restrictions on timber harvest. I'm also going to touch a little bit on fire and fuels, and uh, fire resiliency, and things like that. But Jenna, where's Jenna at? There she is in the back. She is our ID team expert on fire and fuel, so I might defer to her, certainly in the questions, but maybe even in the presentation, we'll see if I can cover it. Um, okay, so the purpose of need, actually, no, I kind of do want to see it while I talk. Can you look there? Oh yeah, okay, that will yeah, cool. Okay, so, um, the purpose of need, you know, one, provide a sustained yield of timber. Uh, these are ONC lands, and we're under the ONC Act. Two, contribute to the conservation recovery of threatened and endangered species. Provide clean water for watersheds. Restore fire adaptive ecosystems. Provide recreation opportunities, and uh, coordinate our management with the Coquille Tribe. So that's the just the bullet points for the purpose of need, and I just want to cover those, you know, in more general terms, and then more specifically, I'm going to be talking about this. Focusing on two, sustain yield of timber and restoring fire adaptive ecosystems. Um, any, probably any questions that you have about the purpose of need and why it is what it is and things like that should be directed to our project manager, Mark Brown, and he's over there. So just so you got to face the main thing. Uh, so this is our, a map of our planning area, and uh, at the blue on the map is moist forest. These are you know deep soil. Um, a lot of rainfall, a lot of Douglas fir, hemlock understory, highly productive forests are in the blue. And in the yellow there, we have um, what we're calling dry forests. Those are typically have thinner soils, uh, less rainfall, uh, less rainfall, more active fire regime, but less pro you know, productive in, in nature. And we do have dry forests, you know, that extend all the way up into the Salem district, you know, all the way down. But as you can see, they're concentrated about halfway up in a Roseburg. They're real concentrated, all in Medford and, and then Cape Falls. You get in our Eugene, Salem, and Coos Bay district, and dry forests are really a minor part of the landscape. So this pie chart here, this is the uh, no action alternative. Uh, and the, the pie chart represents um, different parts of the land that are managed for different purposes. So you know, this piece here with the wood paneling, that's the harvest land base. That's the portion of the land that's dedicated to long-term sustained yield of timber products, you know, wood products. This, uh, this picture here, the old growth forest, that's the late successional reserve. And that's specifically managed for late successional characteristics to help promote the recovery of northern spotted owl, marble murrelet, other late successional associated species. And then this blue here, um, that's the riparian reserve, and that's managed for the fish, uh, water quality, you know, clean, clean, cool water. Um, for the real keen observer here, I just want to point something out that that, that image there, those are tuna in the ocean. Um, I didn't know that until my fish biologist pointed out, but but you get the point, right? It's it's blue. It's got fish. That's the riparian reserve. So you'll see that as we go through. Uh, so this is uh, the the no action alternative. This is the Northwest Forest Plan that we've been managing under since 1994. Uh, so this is alternative A, and as you can see, the, the pie chart has changed, and then I've also added this little breakout here, and 
The breakout is the harvest land base is going to be broken into different pieces, and each of those pieces has a different management style that will happen on them. So um, the red, so pay attention to colors because the colors are meaningful throughout this presentation. Red is what we're calling the high intensity timber area. And that's where you would do clear cutting, no retention trees, rapid reforestation, high productivity of virtual timber. The, um, uh, the flames there, that's the, the dry forest that would be managed, uneven age, the uneven age management, partial harvesting with the objective of fire resiliency, forest health, you know, protection, resistance to insects, and drought, things like that. Now, another piece that you didn't see on the earlier slide is this part here, that's an image of a young plantation, a young forest. And so that's the part, in, in this slide, that's the Lake Succession Reserve. That's the young portion of the Lake Succession Reserve that we would be restoring to accelerate the development into Lake Successional conditions. Now, one thing uh, you'll notice if you read the draft in Appendix B, we've um, elaborated in mean, each alternative, in each one of these categories, what activities will and will not take place, and when you do activities, how you do them, you know, what trees are left behind, which ones are taken, stream buffers, all that stuff's elaborated on. And then one thing I wanted to point out, because our purpose and need is to restore fire adapted ecosystems, that all of our action alternatives look at the dry forest differently. This is different from the Northwest Forest Plan. Northwest Forest Plan essentially treats all forests the same, whether they're moist or dry. In our action alternatives, you're going to see that we've, we've reimagined what restoring fire adapted ecosystems means, not only in the harvest land base, but it also in the LSR and riparian reserves. So this moist dry distinction, fire hazard, forest health carries through in our action alternatives because it's driven by our purpose and need. So uh, this is alternative B, where uh, see that you've got new colors here. You've got pink, you know, like a hot pink, and then a light pink. The hot pink is where you would do regeneration harvest, and you would leave. We're calling that the uh, moderate intensity timber area. So you would do regeneration harvest, but you would leave five to fifteen percent of your stand behind for down wood, snags, uh, overstory green trees, you know, to leave an e ecological function behind. Versus the clear cut that was shown in red before. And then the light pink is a, what we're calling the low intensity timber area, where you're leaving 15 to 30 percent of your, of your trees behind after you do a regeneration harvest. And you notice how the, the, the park here with the flames, that dry forest managed for fire resiliency, that's a, a large chunk of the pie in this one, because we also varied the extent to which that type of management would be applied. And in alternative B, that's the biggest extent without any alternatives. So we also did a sub-alternative, because one of the things that we had uh, working with the recovery plan in Northern Spotted Owls was an uh, issue that had come up was uh, Northern Spotted Owls site management. So we have Northern Spotted Owls sites scattered across the landscape, and they don't know the boundary lines between the land use allocations. A lot of times they'll overlap them. So we wanted to test what if we protected all of those sites, everyone we know about and everyone we've ever known about. What if we protected all those sites? And that results, really everything else was held constant. Um, this is an image of owl sites on the Roseburg district where I work, so it's a, it is a pretty substantial amount of land taken over by the, um, or covered by the home range of this, this species. And as you can see, you know, the result of that is, is a reduction in size of the harvest land base. Oh, and yeah, and I guess it's in addition to the, the portion of the LSR that would be protected under that alternative. Uh, so alternative C has that biggest proportion of the harvest land base that's dedicated to timber production and the biggest portion of the harvest land base that's dedicated to high intensity timber areas so you know, clear cutting uh, in the moist forest and then still having uneven age management in, the, in a, a slightly smaller extent, the very dry forest <coughs> of the land. Uh, so we also did a sub alternative, you know, realizing that older forest is an issue we needed to address. Uh, test some alternative approaches about. So sub-alternative uh, C takes all stands over 80 years old and puts them into the late success reserve category. And so we wanted to see what are the impacts of that, what are the trade-offs associated with that. Um, and as everything else was held constant, so it reduced, essentially reduced the size of the harvest land base by a third. Uh, can I hold questions again? Okay, thank you. Um, so alternative D, now this is uh, you know, moderately sized harvest land base. And one thing you'll notice, remember that image we had of the young, young forest in the LSR that needed restoration to be highly functional owl habitat? 
Notice how those, that chunk of the pie is now over here. So we've taken the young stands in the LSR that need restoration, and we've brought them into the harvest land base to manage them on a sustainable, uneven age management regime, partial harvest, restoring these systems, but never walking away from them from a sustained yield standpoint. They, they would all, always be eligible for some level of harvest. And that's very different. That's an approach, to my knowledge, has not been tested on these lands. Um, so the map of the land use allocation, you take the whole land, and each of these is a square mile. This is, again, this is a little subset of the Roseburg district that I'm really familiar with. Uh, this is the Northwest Forest Plan, uh, land use allocations. Brown and, and light blue are portions of the harvest land base currently. Uh, they call it the matrix in the Northwest Forest Plan, so those harvest land base are synonymous. And the blue is riparian reserves. That's that land that's managed for fish, and water quality, uh, quad quarters. So, and this is, I'll just kind of flash through the alternatives and you see some things change. Remember the colors are relevant, so red indicates where there would be high intensity timber area and clear cutting. That's, that's here, so those areas would be eligible for that. And then the yellow down here, there's just a little bit of it here. That's where you would do uneven niche management, partial harvest to, for fire resiliency, forest health. And then green is the late successional reserve. That's areas that are dedicated to promoting the recovery of like uh, spotted owls and marble owls. So this is alternative B. Remember I said that's the largest extent of the forest that's dedicated to fire resiliency, forest health, dry forest that footprint is largest. So the yellow expands you know, into there, and then you'll see the pink starting to show up. And those are uh, moist forests embedded in that dry forest network. So we've actually made a stand level <coughs> evaluation of whether the, the forest is moist or whether it's dry. So you, rather than section by section, like was done in Northwest Forest Plan. So you'll see in some areas a, you know, a stand that would be managed using uneven age management, and adjacent, like on a south aspect, for example, on the north part of the slope, it may be managed using uh, variable retention harvest, you know, that um, five, to 50, 5 to 30 percent retention regeneration harvest. And then, you know, so here, here's alternative C, and you see a lot more red come back. The extent of that yellow recedes a little bit. We're kind of testing that what's the extent of dry forest that really needs to be managed differently. And then this is alternative E. So notice in all these other action alternatives, this, this block up here, that's a late, late successional reserve, a large block of habitat for the owl. Um, notice in alternative D that a lot of this turns orange. So those are the young plantations. Those are the young stands or uniform stands that would need restoration in like such successional reserve. And the difference is that those would stay, those would remain in the harvest land base and contribute to stay, sustained yield in the long term. <coughs> so uh, in summary, you know, that's just a real basic gloss over. There's a whole lot more than that. But uh, that's a, a variety of different approaches, you know, a variety of a spectrum of approaches that you know, we could be managing these lands under uh, to meet the purpose of need. And so we've, inside that 1600 page document, you're gonna see a lot of detail on what are the outcomes if you use each of these approaches? Or, uh, and then the way we've described it earlier is what elements, you know, elements of these approaches produce better outcomes than others. And that would theoretically help us produce a better final product than proposed RP. So uh, fire and fuels objectives, I'll cover a little bit of this. This is common to all land, are all alternatives, all the actual alternatives. Um, restoring fire adaptive ecosystems is part of our purpose need. So um, and all of the uh, alternatives we have, these, these major objectives. You know, we'll be responding to wildfires, um, meeting land management objectives, and utilizing the full range of fire management options. We'll be actively managing the land to restore and maintain uh, resilience uh, to wildfire, you know, forest health, resistance to insects and drought, things like that. And all alternatives we'll be managing fuels reduce the risk of high severity standard replacement fire. And then we'll be building capacity within our communities to help achieve these goals. Um, yeah, I don't know, like maybe pick on you a little bit, Jenna. Do you have anything you want to add to that? Right. Are you waiting to the break up? Okay, all right. We'll make it fix it. Right, so. <laughs> uh, so within you know the fire and fuels analysis, a deep, in-depth, uh, comprehensive analysis of this issue, and uh, what we found, you know, all the, although the approach to fire and fuels management is common to all. There are some things that influence our ability to restore these systems. And two of the things that really jump out is the size of the harvest land base 
first, and then the timber management type and the intensity. So how you do your harvest affects the fire resiliency, and where you're allowed to do your harvest also affects your, your ability to make substantial changes on the landscape. So uh, here's the, just a conceptual diagram of the intensity of management that we're evaluating. And uh, you know, red is high intensity, so that's the high intensity timber area, including clear cutting. Um, pink is five to 15 percent, we call this moderate intensity timber area. Uh, five to 15 percent retention, but regeneration <coughs> harvest. Um, then the light pink is 15 to 30 percent retention, and then this alternative, we, we even uh, tested what would, what would it mean to use natural regeneration instead of planting delayed reforestation to enhance the development of early successional habitat, things like that. Uh, yellow is uneven age management for, you know, for dry forest and resiliency, partial harvesting. And this green, that, that occurs in alternative D only. That's where you're doing uneven age management to promote the development of owl habitat and then maintain it as habitat. And then two, this is active management in the reserves with no, with no long run sustained yield. You just restore them and then you stop harvesting at some point. So that's kind of active management in the reserves, does not contribute to sustained yield. And then you have passive management in the reserves, which is no harvesting whatsoever. And so in concept, this is the full spectrum of options that we have, you know, from, from clear cutting to nothing and filling in those blanks in between. And so we've, we've tested all these approaches in a variety of different ways within these alternatives. Uh, so here's just some visuals to help you kind of see what I'm talking about. This is, a, you know, that's a clear cut. Well, that leads, you know, where no retention trees are left. It leads to pretty uniform conditions, you know, uniform overstory conditions, uni uniform habitat conditions, not a lot of old growth trees, things like that. Uh, and these yields where we're in the high intensity timber area, high timber production yields, the highest, 60 to 90 year rotations, so relatively short rotations um, on this piece of ground. The moderate intensity timber area, again, 5 to 15% retention. And you're leaving some structure behind. It affects not only what's, what it looks like immediately after harvest, but it affects the composition and structure of your forest. I mean, that's an imprint that'll be left on the forest for the long run. And we'll see that, that in the difference in outcomes. Uh, these are longer rotations, 80 to 140 year rotations on that planting application. Now, so we also have the low intensity timber area, that's 15 to 30% retention. Some of you might have heard about the ecological forestry or Norman Jerry concepts or um, I don't know what else, we do that. secretarial pilot projects in the moist forest that we were doing. This is a flyover of one that I helped work on in the Roseburg District. Douglas Forest Protection Association flew over in their, when they were spotting for wildfires and took a picture of it for us. And so that's an image of that, you know, what that treatment would look like. Just one example of what that treatment would look like. Uh, and these would be the longest rotations. These would be 100 to 160 year rotations before you go back in and do an, another uh, uh, regeneration. Sure. And if we have uneven age management, we have this in two, two flavors, really. It's one for fire, one for owls. And you know, we explored making this one thing, but when you're managing for fire and fuels and drought and things, you tend to want to reduce stand density a little more than if you're managing for owls, you want to do a little bit lighter touch. So those are the two kind of breakouts of uneven age management. And uh, if this is the lowest long-term timber yields that creates and maintains late successional conditions for, for the long run and contributes to sustainable timber. Um, and there's no rotation age, there's no uh, necessarily defined re-entry cycle. It's, it's, uh, you never reset stand age to zero. There's no start over for the stand. It's always a, it's always a forest. It's never reset to that early successional stage as a, as a stand hold. Uh, so this, this graph is uh, density on this side, and this is time and decades. And it goes out 200 years, there's so 20 decades there, it's a long time. But what I'm trying to illustrate is the density reduction. So we have a very dense forest, we come in here and reduce the density. And then after over time, the density increases again, we reduce the density again, and on a cycle. That's sustained yield. And the, the green bar on the top is for owl habitat. The orange bar on the bottom is for fire resiliency. So you have a lower density target, you want more open conditions, uh, less ladder fuels, you know, things like that, and then fire safe condition versus the, um, versus the owl habitat condition. And, but it'd be the same, same concept, just a lower, a higher level of yield versus a lower level of yield. Uh, so we tested our effectiveness at producing 
uh, mature multiple canopy and structurally complex forests, which tend to be strongly selected for by northern spotted owls. And the light green bars on the left are, uh, it's like the current condition of that category of land, you know, what percentage of the land is in that category. And, and this is after 200 years. So, so after 200 years, we're quite effective at producing this habitat where we're, where that's the objective of the land, and that kind of confirms that. Not very much difference between the approaches that we take in LSRs. And then I threw in an alternative D from uh, the owl habitat timber area, um, from alternative D just to show, to, to see how effective that is at promoting owl habitat, or something that's similar to owl habitat. And again, it's highly effective. <coughs> oh, so one thing you notice, I didn't, I didn't uh, point it out soon enough again, same thing I did in Salem last night, is I've got page numbers down here referencing all of these. You know, most of this stuff's taken directly out of the text of the document. <coughs> uh, so this is a difference in um, early successional habitat with structure as the green diamonds in it and then without structure has the yellow. And here's an image that goes along with it. This is a clear cut with no structure. This is a variable retention regeneration harvest with, or, you know, without structure, with structure. And there's been kind of an ongoing social debate, I guess, that, that these are the same thing, that there is no difference between these two. And, and anyway, um, there is a difference. And uh, some of the alternatives will produce a lot of early successful habitat, like, like alternative C, but it would be without structure. Some of the alternatives would produce, sorry, got away. Hey, is that a uh, BLM clear cut? It's not a BLM clear cut, but I would, I would like to uh, not name the land on that one. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so that some alternatives would produce a lot of early successional habitat, but, um, but it would be with structure. So alternative B, for example, versus alternative C. And then, you know, there are just really three major uh, categories. I just broke this out. This is structural development, complex structure in the harvest land base, the area dedicated to timber production. And there's really three, three general patterns that you'll see. If you're doing a lot of uneven age management, you'll end up with a lot of complex late successional structure. If you're doing variable retention harvest on long rotations, you'll end up with a moderate amount of that kind of habitat. If you're doing clear cutting over the majority of your harvest land base, your structures will be relatively simple. And so that's just those three categories. And then, so the intensity of harvest also, the intensity <coughs> of management also uh, corresponds to how much timber production you'll have on a given acre of ground. So on the left, this is the amount of timber that would be produced, four feet per acre per year, from a piece of ground in the north versus the south, uh, where you're doing high intensity timber area. Notice those bars are, are larger. So that's the highest production potential you can get off that ground. On the, and then it goes to uh, variable retention harvest, uneven age management for fire, and uneven age management for owls. And so as you see that the more, the, the way I like to explain it is uh, you have a piece of ground and you have sun, sunlight, you have water, you have nutrients, you, those are site resources. And so this is really showing us that what percentage of the site resources dedicated to long-term sustained yield timber production versus uh, ecological services, large old growth trees, down logs, hardwoods, shrubs, understory plants, things like that. And so this would be theoretically 100%. 100% of your site resources are dedicated to timber. And as you move across, you know, something more like 70, 50, 30% of the site resources on that piece of ground would be dedicated to timber production versus um, other ecological services. And so this is just a little bit of context. Almost at 25 minutes, I'll try to speed up a little bit. Um, this was the historic harvest on BLM lands since 1942. So 1942 to 1952, we were harvesting about 400 million board feet of timber per year. That was mostly coming from around Salem and Portland to build those cities. But uh, you know, so a lot of that was concentrated in the north. Uh, between, it looks like about 1962 and 1987, we might have been harvesting on average around a billion board feet off these lands. And that's when really we, you know, expanded into the southern portion, you know, into this area and started harvesting old growth across the range to produce this timber. And then something happened. Yeah, that means my time's 
So something happened around here that, uh, you know, timber, timber production went way down. And that was, if anybody were paying attention in 1994, there was a spotted owl, a marble beer lead, a coho salmon. There was a lot of issues that came up at that point that caused us, and the Northwest Forest went, caused that harvest to go down. Since then, we've been harvesting something less than 200 million board feet a year. And a lot of that harvest, the pink is regeneration harvest. Uh, and that's been very a very small amount of regeneration harvest. The dark green is thinning, and the light green is thinning from reserved land use allocations. And really how this would look if we were implementing our plan as it's written is that this pink bar would be big, like up to here. The dark green bar would be something small, but filling that gap to this line here, that's our annual sale quantity, that's our sustained yield target that we're, we have a mandate to meet. And then this light green would be in addition to that. So you would have your, your sustained yield target and then your restoration volume would be in addition to that. So really, you know, this is, has been our target. We've been shortfalling for a long time. So here's the timber production, you know, by alternative. And one thing I've, I've heard people say, is your harvesting gonna go up or down? And at least looking at the action alternatives, all of the action alternatives produce more timber per year than we've produced on average since 1995. We've produced on average 167 million board feet a year. So all of the alternatives, including the lowest producing alternatives, uh, produce more timber than what we produced on average since 1995. So harvesting would go up under any of the actual alternatives from what we were used to. And these are uh, you know, restrictions on timber harvest. Obviously, if you're surveying for species and protecting them, that'll reduce your potential to produce timber. Um, big players in that are uh, spotted owls, uh, red tree bowls and marble murelets, which can, can, I mean, this is just an example of marble murelets and alternative D reduce sustained yield by 29 million board feet a year. Uh, tree bowls, 4 million, and northern spot owls, 57 million. So this is in the text, the page number's there. The way to interpret it is the um, ASQ for, or the harvest for alternative D is 176. If you did not have these requirements, you would add 90 to that number, and that would have been the ASQ. So 176 plus 90 is 266, which would affect this graph. So that would be an addition to what's on that graph. So those all kind of interplay, and you've got to be aware of that. Um, and then I think this is my final one. This is looking at kind of it's moist forest reserve management versus dry forest reserve management. I'm saying that we've kind of reimagined what restoration in the dry forest would look like. Um, in the moist forest, you might thin once or thin twice restore it and let it follow its uh, passive successional pathway and it would be a, kind of in an ideal condition in theory. The, uh, in the dry forest, if we're trying to restore these fire adaptive ecosystems to something like what they were, lower, some lower density stands, and fire resistance, fire resilience, you would treat the stand and then if you walk away, it will get dense again. Trees will seed in, and crowns will expand, it will get dense again. And so you'll have to come back and treat again. And then you know, this might be 30, 50, 40 years later, but, but it would get dense again. And so then you treat it again, 30, 40, 50 years later, it would get dense again. And so that's the difference here is the moist forest, your harvest from reserves would decline to zero. They would be restored at some point and be done. In the dry forest, the work would never really be done because you'd be constantly uh, reducing stand density, perpetually reducing stand densities over time. So that's new, I think that's an interesting one. Um, I'll skip over some of this. This is uh, the number of acres per decade that would be treated in each category under each alternative. Uh, that's in there on page 277. Um, Non-commercial hazardous fuel treatments. We uh, use the past to predict the future on that, what we have been doing. Obviously, a lot of this fuels reduction work has been concentrated in the dry forest. A lot of it on Medford and Santa Falls just because. And then this is a volume harvested north versus south. So the top is volume, the bottom is acres, and uh, um, a lot more timber will be produced under any of these alternatives in the northern districts than the southern for a variety of reasons. Um, productive uh, potential of the land, the management style of uneven age management produces less timber. But one thing that's interesting is although the uh, timber volume would be much higher in the north under all these alternatives, 
the um, acres treated is about the same. So, and that's because volume per acre harvested would be less than here than, than up here. Okay. Probably the iPhone again. Are we that's waiting for questions to look at the end? No, we're gonna allow, I'm gonna get questions. I'm just gonna see if I can use that yet. Who is my guy? Someone help me. Right. He, he turned it off. Okay. Let's see if it'll work. Can you hear me? Yep. Hey, there's a volume control for that right there on the camera. Can you hear yeah, me at all? No. no. How about now? Oh, Still not? All right. So. Oh, that turns everything off. Okay, no, it's okay. I, I turned it back on. Can you turn that back on? This one here is for that one. Try again, Donna.
It was put in stone. I mean, I still have the printed version of the RMP that I meant that, you know, I'm a timber sale planner in South River, and I, I read that thing every day, and we follow the rules that were written in, in 1994. Um, science has changed since 1994. Every year, new research comes out. Every single year, um, every single month, new research comes out that's relevant to the management of these lands. And so, we've brought all of that science in, and, and you'll see, I think, in the appendices of the document, rich with citations that did not exist you know, when the Northwest Forest Plan was written. So that's that's not a specific answer, but science did not stand still. Science has continued to evolve since '94. And with regards to riparian, there will be a riparian workshop the next Thursday evening. If you're interested in that side of this particularly, I'll be talking about that now. Okay. We got a couple more hands. I saw Mike's first, and then Doug, then Jack, then Rich. Okay. Quick question: Why do you start defining older age trees at age? Oh, okay. Why why do we define older age, age trees at, at age 80? So that's a good question, and it's not something I elaborated on, but in this um, draft, what we've done, we realize that protecting older trees is a component of restoring, um, promoting the recovery of the spotted owl and marking your land. But what age? What age do you use? What older forest do you protect? What, what, what is necessary? And so we varied our approach to that. And subalternative C, the one that you mentioned, I think it's 80. In alternative C, it's 160. So we, what's the difference? In alternative A, it's 120. Um, in alternative D, we use 120, 140, or 160 on low, moderate, no, high, moderate, and low productivity sites, respectively. And then in alternative B, we went out to our district wildlife biologists and asked them, what's the highest value spotted owl habitat? Make a map of that. And that's used as that older structure complex map of of a, a older forest that was part of the R30, or part of the LSR. So, so I guess the answer is we did bury that in the alternatives. Right. Why? Uh, Why did you pick <coughs> the numbers that you picked? Um, that was a really good question. Why did we pick the numbers that we picked? Yeah, I think um, you know really the critical, the fundamental issue is which older stands need to be reserved. Uh, to promote the recovery of endangered species. And, and we didn't have a real good answer to that, so we were hoping by varying those ages uh, that the analysis would help inform that. And so it's not, that's not a good answer because if we knew which age was the perfect age to pick, we could just pick that, but we don't really know. Dave, I would add that uh, we're looking for structural complexity. Yeah. We're looking for structural complexity. And so we pick up structural complexity starting around age 80. So we varied our approaches from 80 all the way up to 160, seeing how well that captures structural complexity to achieve the objective of contributing to conservation recovery of threatened and endangered species. Anybody want to hear that? Okay. Doug, right. right. Dave, on your slide dealing with fire, <coughs> on your second, I think, and third bullet, it appears to me you could imply that there would be active post-fire management. Is that, uh, is that a fair assumption? Um, are you talking about commercial timber salvage? Yes. Yeah. Okay, um, so I, when you say active post-fire active post -fire management, yes. Uh, uh, if you're talking about fuels reduction, yes, common to all, there would be, there would be an awareness of the fire and fuel situation in response to that and all the alternatives. But when you're talking specifically about commercial timber salvage in the late succession reserves, that, that <coughs> item, that line item, only appears in alternative C. So all the action alternatives uh, prohibit timber salvage in the late succession reserves for economic reasons, with the exception of alternative C, which requires you, essentially, to harvest, to salvage harvest in the late succession reserves for economic reasons. So another place we vary the approach. So I've got Jack and Rich, and then I'm going to move us to the next speaker, and then we can have, we'll have time for more after the third speaker goes. But I want to make sure we get through the presentation and get some big questions here, and have time for some other questions. Jack, all are up there. In the development of your pie charts, what percentage of the lands that you consider are ONC lands? 
What oh. percentage are ONC lands? Well, I'm sorry, I can't answer that with a number. It's the vast majority. There's a small percentage that are um, PD lands, and then some that are the east side management lands uh, within the bounds of the decision area, but I, I don't have a number for you at this time. Okay. I'm sure it's in the text. Yeah. Okay. So if we can find it for you before the, the end of the evening, we'll get that for you, okay? And Rich, you next. I've got a policy question. Can you stand? Can you policy, up? Policy, policy question. question. Um, during the, well, for about the past 15 years, the district managers have been given total discretion about whether to clear cut or not, and wisely decided maybe we're not going to go down that route. So most of the volume is coming from thinning. But this plant, every action alternative takes away that discretion of the district manager and says you will uh, do a certain percent of clear cutting on the, on the high intensity lands and areas from A to C. So that discretion has been taken away from them. So they will be mandated to clear cut. I don't think that's the right idea. I'm just wondering why, why you want to do that and maybe we ought to have some wheel room. Yeah, I think uh, I think that's a good comment. That you know, I'm, I'm not going to respond that directly, but uh, but we do everything in the draft is draft, and you know the reason we're here is to inform you on the kind of thought process analysis we did, and, and that, that's a perfect kind of thing that we'd like to see a comment directly, quote, cite the thing in the text that you see, explain what you like, what you don't, and why. I mean, the why is really important. Um, and we're gonna we're gonna be looking at all those comments in the formulation of the proposed article. All right, 